Audio testing, one, two, three, lights on, camera rolling, and action. Welcome to the Scaling Creator Podcast, the one-stop shop that explores problems, solutions, and stories for business-minded creators. I'm Soren Dickens. And I'm Erickson Dickens. We'll be talking about everything from self-discovery, storytelling, leadership, marketing, sales, operations, and finance. If you like a healthy dose of education mixed with a generous dash of insightful entertainment, prepare for your ears to be pleasured. Mm. Oh, yeah. Make sure to check us out at scalingcreator.com and also join our free Discord community. Scaling Creator launching in three, two, one. The following content is not intended for all listeners, but we strongly encourage all listeners to listen regardless. All righty, welcome back to the Scaling Creator podcast. I'm Soren Dickens. I'm here with Erickson Dickens. We're here in the production van. We're actually sitting outside our mother's house in Oakdale, and we've been here for a couple weeks, and it's been a great time. It's been lovely. It's been really nice. Today, we're going to be talking about college and the origins of Platinum Peak, our video production agency. In this episode, we're going to be talking about where we attended college and how we both ended up at the same college later in life. We're going to be talking about the origins of Platinum Peak, some of the early days of Platinum Peak and what we went through in that experience. And we're going to be talking about what we learned along the way when we were just starting out. Before we started filming, I was going through the refrigerator here at mom's and I was going through looking for like maybe some vodka or something. And I reached down and I grabbed the bottle of uh, ivermectin. Mm. And I was like, hmm, yep, we're in post-COVID days. And it just reminded me about how I got through traveling all through COVID with my little bottle of ivermectin. Because, you know, that's how we do it out here in Oakdale. We just go to Tractor Supply and we buy the ivermectin for the livestock. (laughs) Because the doctors won't prescribe it. So that was kind of funny. Horse medication. Yeah. It wasn't the vaccine? It wasn't the vaccine. Hmm. Um, I didn't find any of those in the refrigerator. <laughs> I did find vaccines for the livestock, but not for ourselves. Oh, I got you. <laughs> yeah. So that's funny. And yeah, I've enjoyed being here in Oakdale and <clears throat> it's always a good time being here and then looking back down at San Luis Obispo where we live part time and where we went to school and how times have changed so much from the early days yeah. at Cal Poly where we were going to school when we were driving back and forth nearly every weekend for projects. <laughs> for a while, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy that it's been eight years now since we were both down there initially. Like I look back on that still to this day and I cannot believe that it's been eight years. And mm-hmm. man, it's cliche, but time flies. And the older I get, I'm feeling it more and more. I'm feeling it. Mentally, and I'm feeling it physically. I mean, gosh, bad back over here, you know, two epidurals in the last month. But uh, I'm alive, and I'm happy. So, Hey, that's what's most important, right? I think these these times we'll look back on when we're, you know, 35 Mm -hmm. and say, wow, that feels like yesterday. Yeah. And uh, especially our times at Cal Poly and how it all started. And man, what a beautiful, chaotic, messy blur. It all kind of was. That's a great way to describe it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good way to describe it. I feel like our experience, when we talk to other people who have gone to Cal Poly, people who might be 30, 35, 40, even our mom who went to Cal Poly, other family members who are older that went to Cal Poly, their experiences seem so much different than ours. Mm-hmm. And I think that that really came down to where we were at in life at the time we were at Cal Poly. We were just coming out of being athletes. You were playing college baseball. I was swimming in college and we decided, you know what, it's time to move on and focus on the next chapter of life. And we decided to look elsewhere and dive into other interests. And I think that taking that path is what gave us that other experience. I think we had a lot of similar experiences to people who went to Cal Poly. I mean, it's beautiful down there. We were going on the same hikes, the same restaurants, the same camaraderie of Cal Poly alumni and the same camaraderie among people who may have went to Cal Poly. I think that that's similar, but in terms of the people who are going there now, when you look back on it, since we still live there, Mm -hmm. times have definitely changed. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And honestly, looking back on it, I really, I can't say personally and I know you probably feel the same way to an extent, but I can't really look back on my Cal Poly days and say, wow, I had the time of my life down there. Mm -hmm. Great memories, great friends, just all around A plus experience. And it goes to your point saying that it's just kind of where we were at life, like the, the, the point of our lives when we were down there. To be blunt, like for me, I know as we've talked about in the past at Cal Poly, just during our times there, it was kind of a dark time a little bit for me personally, like, feeling very out of place, um, 
lonely kind of what do I do with my life now that my sport was gone? I guess we can dive into that a little bit. I think, you know, given some context there about how we both ended up there and why we ended up together in that same predicament of losing that part of our identities at the same time, ironically. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so, I mean, you want to start or you got a scholarship to Cal Poly. Yeah. So I had a swim scholarship to Cal Poly and I was excited to go down to Cal Poly. It was going to be a new experience. Um, swimming in college had always been a, a goal of mine. D1, right? Division always, one. Was the I wanted the scholarship, everything that I was groomed, groomed and almost expected to have. I achieved that. And unfortunately, three days before we went down the training camp, I got in a mountain biking accident at Mammoth. I was riding with one of my close friends, Peter. Mm-hmm. We were doing um, some mountain biking up in Mammoth and I went over the handlebars, smashed my head, screwed up my shoulder, ended up in the urgent care over there in Mammoth. And I remember calling mom, telling her that I'm really injured and I'm supposed <laughs> mom, to... I messed up. Yeah. <laughs> it's like 18 years of work down the drain. Pretty much. Thanks, Peter. Shout out Peter Metcalf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty much. And in the moment, it was devastating. Looking back on it, it was a total blessing in disguise. It had to happen mm-hmm. because I, I know that if I would have continued to be a collegiate athlete, we would not be where we're at today, Mm -hmm. but it definitely put us on a trajectory towards a very dark couple of years. And when I look, go ahead. I was just going to ask, were you already, weren't you already swimming a little bit on the team at that point when you got hurt or did that happen before you even went down for like summer training camp? It happened before I went down there for summer, summer training camp. So I sat on the deck for, I think a three, four weeks. Because they wouldn't let you Because swim? I couldn't pass the concussion test oh, to be cleared to actually swim. That's right. So that was a rough three weeks. And there was a lot of internal dialogue festering and a lot of questioning happening that I've never really had before. Mm-hmm. I, I was down in a new environment. I was surrounded by people who were there for a different reason. I also saw that there was so much to do down in San Luis Obispo. And In college, you really have a lot of free time Mm -hmm. to do whatever you decide to put your time and energy into. And I decided, you know what? I want to put my time and energy into other things. And after three weeks of that and not feeling great, not being able to pass the exam, I almost made up my mind before I did pass the exam. I ended up swimming for about a week Mm -hmm. and then decided, you know what? I need to focus on what I'm here for. I'm here. I'm not going to be a professional swimmer. And I don't think a lot of athletes understand that until their last game or their last event, that they're not really going to make a career out of it. And that's what you're in college for. So I decided, Hey, I'm going to throw the towel in Mm -hmm. and we're going to dive into something else. And at that time we really didn't know what it was. (laughs) Like hanging out in your dorm room, watching YouTube videos. (laughs) I think we spent a lot of time in my dorm room watching Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton debates imp- debates and impersonations. <laughs> we were like, yeah. these debates are funny. Let's go find yeah. funnier videos online about these debates. Yeah. Oh gosh. That's a whole other rabbit hole. But let me ask you a question. Like yeah. when you decided to finally hang up the towel, hang up the speedo, do you feel like there was a sense of burnout already? Like you had spent your entire life swimming competitively year round, you know, double day practices. Do you feel like when you actually got to the college stage, you kind of reached that end goal and that passion wasn't really there like the love of the the sport wasn't there as much and or was it really just like that's when you finally realize yeah i'm just it's it's done i think when i got to college i realized that and we were just talking about this today a little bit with some of the scaling creator content that we were putting out the podium the end goal Mm -hmm. if you set a goal that actually has a finish line the moment you reach it you're gonna sit down yeah. You're going to be done and you're going to say, you know what? There isn't anything beyond this. I want to go on an indefinite journey. I think that's the right word. I want to go on mm-hmm. a journey that doesn't have a um, an end date. Yeah. And ultimately, that wasn't the end of my swimming career. I took time off after I recovered. And then I got back in the pool and swam one last season independently in a club league. Mm-hmm. But I would say that the identity shift was what had the biggest impact on me in terms of going to college being this athlete and then realizing, holy cow, when I woke up at five in the morning, there was a transition period. I woke up at five in the morning and I realized I was like, holy cow, I need to go to a swim practice. So I actually joined a swim club just to go do something early in the morning to feel like I was to fill the void. And I think a lot of people 
struggle with that when they transition through sports. And so the conversations that I've had since, you know, stepping away mm-hmm. from swimming have been just so deep and enriching because yeah. everyone struggles with that when they step away from the sport. Yeah. Did you feel at all like, any sense of like shame or guilt having spent so much energy throughout your life dedicated to the sport? you know, deciding to step back, was there any sense of, I feel bad, like all the people around me who put so much into me mm-hmm. and dedicated so much of their time to me, finally deciding to move on, was there any sense of like internal uh, regret or shame, any of that? Because that, that's common sometimes yeah. in athletes, you know? Yeah, when you spend your entire life as an athlete working towards a goal and having this expectation that you're going to be this athlete later on in life, mm-hmm. and then you step away from it, there is so much guilt that starts to eat you alive. You know, however you cope with that, that's your own thing. But what I would say is when you start to make that transition, you have to look at what you've accomplished and how that's going to supplement whatever you're going to do next. Because when I look back at my experience, I was just beat every single day. Mm -hmm. You're going through this identity crisis because people knew you, you knew yourself as I am a swimmer and people would know you as that. I would know myself as that. I filled all of my time and energy and made decisions in life. I gave up things to do swimming. I gave up things to stay safe and not get hurt and not go skiing and not climb mountains and not go mountain biking again because I had to be a swimmer, which meant I needed Mm -hmm. to keep my body in optimal shape. I needed to keep my mind fresh and uh, it's a year round 24 seven year round 24 seven. You can't take days off yeah. every day. You take off is two days out. And yeah. I mean, you, you went through the same experience. What happened with yeah. you when you stepped away? Initially at first, a great feeling of relief, like, Oh my gosh, I'm done. I was so ready for this. And then it hit me a little bit later, but I guess to give some, some context here, some backstory, I, I got a scholarship out of high school as well. And I ended up at Stanislaus State in Turlock. Wasn't exactly where I thought I would be. Had a couple other offers, but Stanislaus State gave me the most uh, in terms of a scholarship. I had a lot of friends that were going to be going there as well that I grew up playing with. Uh, my lifelong coach was going to be coaching there, so it made sense. So, And I also kind of wasn't really ready to leave our home area, if I'm being honest. Like it was right in our backyard. It's 25 minutes from Oakdale. It just felt right. Like it it seemed like all the pieces kind of came together and that's where I was being led to go. Uh, Ended up at Stanislaus State and came in starting as a freshman, feeling good. First preseason game, blew out my hamstring. And for anyone who plays sports or is familiar with uh, (laughs) athletics, uh, you know a hamstring is kind of a death sentence, especially if you're not getting the best care. What was that like at a small sports school? Where, mm. Was there much care? Because I know people who might be looking at going into yeah. college athletics, it's probably something to consider. Oh, for sure. For sure. And I'm not going to bag on the school. I'm not trying to, you know, paint them in a bad light. Um, I right. have a lot of respect for the people over there, but just put it very simply, I was told numerous times that it's a strain. It's a strain. Spoiler alert. Two years later, I finally did get an MRI and it was torn. Mm-hmm. I, to this day, I have a partially torn hamstring. Right. And so I was led to believe by the athletic trainers that, so oh, this is something that can just be fixed with you know, so-and-so, ice and stem, ice and stem, go to the trainers every day. Turns out the damn thing was torn. So that's why it didn't hold up, uh, which was unfortunate, you know, because I look back on it and if I would have kind of known what was going on, what the actual truth of the diagnosis was, I don't know, things could have been different. But uh, long story short, just to get to the point here, I, I didn't play very much my freshman year because my hamstring just wouldn't hold up. And at that point, I was uh, really feeling like I I was just kind of ready to move on a little bit. You know, like I was here at this small state school, not much of a college experience, to be honest. Stanislaus State's somewhat of a high school on steroids, if you will. Most of the people, it's a commuter school. So I wasn't really broadening much of my experience, if you know what I mean. But I decided to play one more year. You know, I don't want to go out on a bad note, right? I barely played my freshman year. I played baseball my whole life. I might as well give it one last shot and do the best I can and go out with a bang, you know, one of those things. And um, talked to my mom about it. And we decided that was kind of the, all right, let's do it. Sophomore year came around. And uh, this is, I wish I was joking here, but first game of the season, hamstring hasn't caused me any issues. First game, I get a hit, 
rounding first base, hamstring goes out again. Same everything, same feeling. Oh my gosh, I was so upset. So yeah, I was right back on the bench and um, I was out for four weeks. This is where it gets really fun. This is where I kind of look at God and say, you are a jokester, my friend. After four weeks of doing the whole rehab thing, I got back on the field. I'm all excited. I'm back. You know, this is probably my final season. Going to make the best out of it. And I'm doing high knees down the line. It's warm-ups before practice. And the only person whose foot ended up in a sprinkler hole that the coaches forgot to cover or the maintenance crew or whoever was mine. My foot ended up in a sprinkler hole. And it was so loud, the pop of my ankle, that the bullpen actually heard it. At Jesus that point, I was Christ. just like, this is a sign, man. You know, it's, it's the God, it's, it's, I'm being told that my time as an athlete, as a baseball player is probably coming to an end because who did, like, well, how does that happen? Long story short, again, after that point, the rest of my season, I barely played. I just, my hamstring, my ankle just wasn't the same. I was losing passion. I really was feeling like it was just time to leave, hang up the cleats, move on to the next chapter. Mm -hmm. And so I applied to a bunch of different colleges. I got into a couple. One of the ones that I got into was Cal Poly. Barely spent any time down there. Honestly, my mom went there. I knew you were going there. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a, a huge plus. And so I ended up, okay, you know what? Let's do Cal Poly. And so I transferred down there as a junior when you were coming in as a freshman. And that is where our journey really begins. That was a lot of information, but there you go. There's your context. And when I got to Cal Poly, I had all these preconceived expectations of how college was going to be, my college life. I was going to join, you know, all these organizations. I was going to make a lot of friends. It was just going to be like San Jose State where I had tons of baseball buddies and friends in that life. Right. I'm really going to integrate well. None of it came true. None of it. Not one of the things that I kind of expected came true. Yeah. I think the looking back on it, we ended up at Cal Poly together and – we were both at the same place in life, walking away from sports, mm -hmm. shifting our identities from seasoned athletes, our entire lives, decent students, I guess, Yeah. for yourself. I was on I, honor roll, baby. I was not a great student the last couple of years of high school, but I did end up in college. Thank you, swimming. <laughs> but I would say we were both at the same place in life, moving away from those identities. And I know I personally found myself very quickly adopting a new identity as fast as I could mm -hmm. when we stepped away from our sports and we decided, Hey, you know what? Let's uh, get back into this making videos. We used to make videos when we were kids. We always talked about making videos through our later teenage years before we got to college, but we didn't do a lot of making videos. Mm -hmm. So I remember I would say at least a couple months of talking about it. And then I had a drone that I bought mm -hmm. when I was in high school and I remember we would go out and fly the drone. We would at least be making video footage. I had a GoPro. We'd be at least be making video footage, but it wasn't anything great. And then we decided we should really get back into this. Mm -hmm. Let's just get a camera and dive back into this. But that, was, that was months after we ended up down there together. Yeah, it, it, it was. was a, there was a lot more time of I what we, the hell are we doing? We spent a lot of time talking reflecting, thinking, yeah. diving into like the past and mm -hmm. how we ended up at this point. We did. Um, just sitting in the car or whatever. Like there was just a lot of downtime. and Yeah. There was a lot of reflecting going on and it was something that we were doing because we were put in that position to do that after mm -hmm. stepping away from sports. Whereas most of the kids our age were out partying and making friends and doing the things that they were doing in college. Mm -hmm. I personally was burnt out of that. Mm -hmm. I came from a situation in high school where junior year of high school, I went to Davis and I had like an experience where I met a bunch of new people. It was almost like you leave high school to go to college, you meet a bunch of new people. You kind of go through this experience of making a whole new friend group, right? I had that a couple of years before I went to Cal Poly. And by the time I went to Cal Poly, I had already made that second friend group and had this exposure to somewhat of a college experience. And I was just like, you know what? I want to focus on what the next chapter of my life is going to be because I had this identity crisis in a way where I was this swimmer. I had all of this status, as you would say, around this identity. And I knew that if 
I didn't dive in headfirst and go aggressive towards what I wanted to be after college, I was going to spend 20 years building this career to find that status again, because I just spent 15 years building this identity around mm. swimming and I knew how much energy and time it took to finally get to a goal. And so when we did decide, Hey, let's dive into this next chapter of our life, making videos, it was like, how can I absorb the most information? How can I reflect as much as I can on what made us who we are? Mm -hmm. I would say that that was where my headspace was. And then you multiply that by just being absolutely lost. Mm -hmm. So there was all this ideation, yeah. this vision, but then when you peeled back this long-term vision mm -hmm. for what I wanted, I was just like, holy cow, I have no idea what we're gonna do. Mm -hmm. Especially being from Oakdale and not really having any ties to any connections in the industry or mm -hmm. knowing people in the space of filmmaking, video yeah. production, videography. YouTube was just getting pretty popular. So you tie in an identity crisis to having dreams and aspirations of a really deep rabbit hole of the unknown. <laughs> you're just like- Like an existential crisis. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah you're just lost. Uh, lost is a great way to put it. I remember moving to Cal Poly, moving to San Luis Obispo, about four hours away. It was the first time that I had lived somewhere other than our home area. Um, you at least had some experience living in Davis, a couple hours from here, um, your last two years of high school. But when I moved to San Luis Obispo, I felt like a fish out of water, even though it's really not that much bigger than Oakdale. Just the fact it was so far away and the environment was different, the people were different. I had a really hard time adjusting to that. And that kind of plays into one of my weaknesses at times is getting out of my comfort zone. Um, when I went to Cal Poly, I was so used to having a built-in friend system. That is a baseball team. Growing up with a baseball team, you know, you spend so much time with these guys, you really kind of forget how to make friends outside of the team. And that was my issue. I was so accustomed to not really having to put myself out there to cultivate friendships, to meet new people, because I was so used to having that built-in system. I was so naive because I just assumed that moving to Cal Poly, friends would just amass in front mm -hmm. of me. I just said, they, they would come to me or I would, just, we would meet and that didn't happen. And I tried to rebuild my identity by, you know, I would join, I joined a few clubs on campus. I would infiltrate, um, some friends of mine who were from Oakdale that were down there already try to infiltrate their friend groups and just mingle any way I kind of could go to the farmer's market and walk around and hope a, someone would come up to me or we would just make a connection and we'd be friends. But I realized quickly that's just not how it works, especially if you're not going to be in Greek life, especially if you're not going to join a sports team. I found myself in a position where it was very difficult for me. And I thought that moving in on campus, joining the transfer dorm area that I would just meet people and that didn't come. And I didn't have the strength or the, the just the outgoing characteristics to just continue that. And so I found myself, oh, just stuck in my dorm room watching movies or just reading or whatever it was, not putting myself out there. Yeah, it was hard. I definitely, at one point even uh, thought about transferring back to Santa Claus State, um, it's that FOMO, you know? But then when you and I started talking, I just kind of realized that en uh, enough is enough in terms of wasting time. We have all this time on our hands. Let's do something with it. Let's put it towards something. And the identity crisis is real. And we kind of got hit with an identity crisis that age, whatever we were, 20 and 18. Do you think that's common for athletes in terms of an identity crisis who've played so long? Do you think it's kind of one of those unforeseen mini traumas in a way that a lot of people experience who've played sports their whole life? but don't know really how to communicate it. Do you feel like it's kind of one of those things, an unforeseen mini trauma? That's how I kind of put it. I would say yes, yeah. because when an athlete steps away from what they're accustomed to doing, mm -hmm. it's no different than what we've grown up to knowing with having family around or having traditions around mm -hmm. or having really anything consistent in your life. And then when all of a sudden, it's cut out of your life because you don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. Prior to stepping away, you needed to show up on the baseball field. Mm -hmm. You needed, it was expected of you to do something. And then when you step away from it, yeah, it's not expected of, it's not expected of you anymore. And so, and it's not that, and I've, I've 
I kind of had this internal dialogue before myself. And I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are. It's not that you're not expected to be there, but other people expected you to be there. Mm -hmm. And you almost felt obligated to be there for your teammates and for your coach. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I would miss swim practice, I wouldn't feel guilty because I missed swim practice. I would feel guilty because of what my coach was thinking. Sure. I was guilty of how my teammates were going to perceive me. Mm -hmm. Really like when I miss things now and when I miss something and look at, oh, I missed that meeting. It's like, this is my time. Mm -hmm. Like I make my own decisions. But back then you're cultured to believe people are looking out for you. You should be looking out for your team. A lot of that indoctrination that you go through as a young athlete, which is absolutely a good thing. Yeah. But also seeing the other side of it when you're older, okay, you miss a swim practice or you miss a baseball practice. Maybe you wouldn't feel good. You shouldn't be feeling guilty. I remember missing a morning swim practice when I was in high school and being not asleep because I was so sick to my stomach about mm -hmm. how my coach was going to react when I got to evening practice mm -hmm. that I didn't even sleep through it. I felt worse. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. You're spot on. I agree with everything you just said. I think too, people tend to, it's not just a sport. It's not even really the sport at all. In my opinion, it's the feeling or the thing that they associate with the sport. So the feeling that they get from that sport, or maybe they associate their sport with success, fitness, friends, um, a loved one who taught them the sport. There's a lot of different things that I think are associated with the actual thing to where that's what actually gives it meaning. For me personally, like dad, our father, was my lifelong baseball coach, and it was kind of always expected of him, um, our family, that you know you're going to be a baseball player. You know, played Division One, whatever. You're going to be a successful baseball player. He passed away when we were kids, and so there was always this part of me that associated baseball with my dad. It was like, in a way, uh, if I kept playing baseball, then there was a piece of him that was still living in mm -hmm. a sense. And so when I gave up baseball, at first I felt great. I was ready to move on. And then I started to reflect more because we had a lot of downtime. We had a lot of, what am I doing with my life? So reflecting on all that, and it really made me, did I let dad down? I feel kind of guilty. Um, should I have kept playing? And it felt in a sense that dad really, truly, fully died in a way. And I think that's why some of those times at Cal Poly was so dark for me because it felt like my dad was completely gone. When I was playing baseball, there was still a little bit of a piece of him that was, uh, he felt like he was kind of alive in a way. Like his legacy was living on through me, all the things that he taught me as a kid I was still doing, and it was gone. And I think that's what really spurned me to eventually come up with that idea after we got back into filmmaking. This is a little down the road, but got back into the idea of making the uh, documentary about his life. Right. You know, like kind of preserve the legacy, uh, work through all those feelings, those emotions. Um, and that resulted in, in creating something that, you know, <laughs> took a lot, a lot of time on both of our, our ends. And sure. Turned into something beautiful. But I think that there was something to be said about that that other people experience when they're stepping away from sports. They're not stepping away from the sport itself, but they're stepping away from the memories mm -hmm. that they had growing up mm -hmm. that were probably a lot better because they were so foreign and there was less repetition before that. Mm -hmm. Bef you know, when you were a young kid playing baseball with dad, the experiences that you had were new and they were euphoric. But by the time you were a sophomore playing college baseball and you were hurt and you mm -hmm. were just like cranking out games and practices, it was just like redundant. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. Not, I lost some of that spark too. That was a, my passion for baseball after dad died just because he wasn't there anymore. And so it was like a piece of the game wasn't even there. And, but that's a whole other side note. I understand what you're saying. Totally. I think a lot of times the things that keep us tied to what we're doing in life are memories that are 10, 15 years before us. Yeah. And we might not be completely in love with where we're at now. And it's the things that happened in the past that keep us tied to the game. Mm -hmm. And I was there. Yeah. And sometimes those memories we have of those brighter days, they're oftentimes glamorized. Mm -hmm. They're oftentimes, there's some stat out there that the majority of your memories are not actually 
real Mm -hmm. or they're real, but they're not, they're, they're not actually how they happened. Right. I read about that in grad school of how our memories are very deceiving. Mm -hmm. And if you lean into them for too much, you almost kind of create this fake backstory that didn't really exist. That's so accurate. Yeah. That's that's true. Yeah. I I experienced that too. Even recently we were talking about some of the early baseball days when dad was coaching us, when we were playing baseball, you were like 10, we were at the Piccadilly Inn, state championships. And by the time everyone's kind of told their perspective of the story, it was like, it was a, (laughs) it was an absolute movie. Like it was so sick, but I remember being there and it was hot Uh and Spencer cut his finger open Mm -hmm. and it was not good. And everyone's getting their butts kicked. Mm -hmm. But when you look back on it and you hear everyone's perspective, you can almost make it a movie. Mm -hmm. And so when you are 18 years old and you're about to step away from your sports career mm-hmm. or you're 22 or whatever, you've just gone through your college you know, sports career, you really do have to look back and say, what do I remember? What were my memories? And not let, not let the outside commentary mm-hmm. dictate what your next steps are. Yeah. Because you look at it objectively, anyone who's going to be telling you about a past memory is going to be telling you the best story that they remember and being yeah. a storyteller. Yeah. People are good storytellers. They're Uh going to tell you the best story and it's going to make you feel good. No one's going to tell you a story to make you feel bad about the past. Uh So you really have to like sift through the stories that you're hearing about the past before you make a decision to step forward in the future. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. I think that you and I did a lot of that at Cal Poly, those late nights in the car, hanging out or hanging out in your dorm room, talking a lot. Because we were at that age too where, and this is another psychological fact or whatever we want to call it. Our brains and stuff were maturing into adult brains. And that's when a lot of things start coming forward. You know, we didn't have that crutch anymore in a lot of ways. You swimming, me baseball. We were just our authentic selves in a sense. And so once you don't have that thing that you lean on, that's when a lot of things start coming forward. Emotions, um, suppressed trauma, if you will, thoughts that maybe weren't fully fleshed out. And so luckily, you know, you and I had each other during that time to dissect all those things together. I remember conversations about our childhood, about our past, our beliefs. And I think those conversations are important. And I think a lot of people need to have those conversations when they experience similar uh, situations that we did. And luckily, I, I feel at least that those conversations, those, those dialogues we had, they propelled us forward. Those conversations that we had put us on this path to self-discovery, mm-hmm. which, which led into this you know, rabbit hole of personal development and understanding yourself and exploring ideology and exploring really the characteristics that make up who you are as an early adult. And I think that is what ultimately pushed us into this realm of storytelling mm-hmm. and creative work because once we dove into it yeah. and we started to have these conversations, it almost gave us the confidence to be able to understand stories and mm-hmm. understand perspectives that we may not have you know, aligned with. So yeah, let's just dive into it, how we actually pulled our shit together, for lack of a better word, and, and dove into it. From what I recall, one day, one of many redundant days, hanging out in your dorm room, you at one point just brought it up, hey, let's get back into filmmaking. Should, should we get a camera? Or should I buy a camera? Yeah. Uh, like you said earlier, you already had a drone, you dabbled in it a little bit uh, occasionally, but you're like, you know, maybe we should get a camera get back into our childhood love of filmmaking. You know, what do you, what do you think? Is it, a, should we do it? And I remember being like, why not? We have nothing better going on. Obviously we had kind of been out of the filmmaking game for a while, but that sounded great to me. I mean, mm-hmm. is that in line with your memories? Cause like we were talking about memories can be deceiving. So I was curious, like yeah. that something like that, right? Yeah, that's, I'm, that's exactly how I remember it. I remember that we were, We spent a lot of time watching YouTube videos and obviously had exposure to creators, people making videos. Mm -hmm. I decided to go down the rabbit hole of the early YouTubers who were talking about the different cameras that were accessible, the new DSLRs that people had been buying. The mirrorless technology had just come out with Mm -hmm. DSLRs, so it was a lot cheaper to get your hands on a video camera than it used to be to get your hands on a cinema camera or something that was of the standard of what people would want if they were to hire you to make videos. So we did it. We, I remember we bought a camera and I remember getting the camera and now thinking, okay, we have to go make a video. Yeah. And so 
I'm pretty sure we took the drone, we took the camera, we mm-hmm. took Nathan Clark mm-hmm. and Jessica Aiken out to Montana de Oro, was which Jess is, I'm, I'm pretty sure she was. Okay. Yeah, because I think we even might have shot it on her Nikon. I don't remember that. I don't remember her there at all. I remember Wizard there. Or I remember, uh, I think what, we had a Nikon, we, we bought a camera, returned it, uh-huh. bought another camera, returned it because it was just not the right one. Uh-huh. And it was in the days of Amazon where you could just yeah. like buy packages and return them. And it was like, whatever. Yeah. So we did that. We went out to Montana de Oro. We shot, uh-huh. it was called. Detached in Beauty. Detached in Beauty. Yeah. And it was a hit. Is that still on YouTube? <laughs> it's still on YouTube. <laughs> Is it really? Yeah. Oh, no way. It's still on YouTube. We took Nate out. Uh-huh. Nate's a tall, good-looking kid from SoCal. Yeah, he was the model. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, bought in. Like our, our first video was shooting a your college roommate out in nature in a model shoot. <laughs> yeah, it would be pretty cringy if we were to shoot something yeah, like that today. Yeah. But it was a hit back yeah. then. I remember posting it in the Cal Poly page. Mm-hmm. People loved it. People loved the drone because drones were really new back then. And I was probably one of the first people to have a consumer drone. When DJI released their first drone the first phantom that at least consumers could get their hands on it was easy to use mm-hmm. i bought it i remember it was two thousand dollars way overpriced for the quality of what it was and i remember buying it we took the drone out we took the i remember we took out we every took piece stabilizer. of gear we, we took used everything. a stabilizer we got a stabilizer yeah, we bought a ronin yeah we, we just went for it we, we went even, for we, it we just, did we pick a song beforehand or afterhand because it was it wasn't a music video it wasn't really a montage it was like this combination of both uh, i don't know if we really had a plan but we were just like you know what let's pick up the camera let's pick mm-hmm. up the drone and let's just go shoot i don't think we had a plan i think we just put it together in post we went out there mm-hmm. shot a bunch of shots that were artistic mm-hmm. to our own eye yeah and went forward with it and then shortly after that we made a video about substance abuse which may or may not have told the story of where we were at in life <laughs> where we were heading but or where yeah. we were heading but it was about substance abuse, how it leads to depression and how depression leads to suicide oh God, or how depression so leads to substance abuse and then substance abuse leads oh. to overdosing and yeah. dying. Super dark. I remember releasing I that died. one. I died in the video. Mm-hmm. We used Johnny Cash's song. Hurt by Johnny Cash. I hurt myself today. Yeah. Jesus, Lord, we were. Yeah, we were in a dark place. It's a good thing we got those cameras. <laughs> No, yeah, I remember that. We should definitely try to find that and watch that. I still have it. Do you really? Yeah. Holy cow. We could take a break and watch it. <laughs> Jeez. I forgot about that one. I completely forgot about that video that we made. It was like in your dorm room, and I don't even know how we came to that. But uh, uh, reflecting on Detached in Beauty, you know, mm-hmm. the, the one that really got things going, I remember, you know, putting that together, and then we were when we were done editing it, looking at it and thinking, wow, this is actually halfway decent for literally our first sure. try. And we released it. I don't know. I didn't have social media at the time, but somehow it got around a little bit and I sent it to some friends and they were like, you made this? Like, this looks yeah. like a Mazda commercial because we yeah. used your Mazda in it, the drone shots with the Mazda. And that was really reassuring. And that gave us, I think, a little bit of confidence that, you know, if we stay on this course Maybe this could lead somewhere. And then from there, gosh, what was our next project? We did something with well, Cam. I, have, I just pulled it up right now. No. So Carpe <laughs> Diem Productions. Carpe, okay, that was our name. Carpe yes. Diem. Seize the day. Seize the day. The Super original. The opposite of what we've been doing for the past six months. But yeah, we were seizing the day at we this point. We were watching a lot of motivational videos on YouTube, yes, yes. which led us to Carpe Diem. discovering Carpe Diem. Mm, yes, yes. So after that, one of our friends was dating his lost love and we decided to make a film called finding lost love we took two of our friends out to elfin forest which is this beautiful lush forest wooden pathway Mm. over there in los osos california it's amazing if you haven't checked it out you should absolutely check it out next time you're on the central coast but we took them out i'm gonna watch the first 15 seconds of this and oh man that logo intro cringe and we used it's mountain monsters and men Basically, we just filmed them like oh running gosh. after each other, right? And chasing after each other just in the woods. There are some good shots in here. We should post some of that. Snippets of like our very first videos. Well, we I think made. we're going to have to post some of it now that we're talking about Can it on this it? podcast. Can I see it? Oh my gosh. Weren't we shooting that on um, a gimbal? Like the, yeah. the Osmos. Hello, <laughs> 
<laughs> it's literally just running. It's so cringe. It's like, Cam, just run 50 yards. Hey, drone shots are still on point, though. Well, I would yeah. say that... It got the creative juices flowing. What was our first paying job? Do you remember? Because I remember. George. 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 So our first paying job, once we really started to get flowing with mm -hmm. making these edits on social media at the time, it was YouTube and I don't even think it was Instagram, but it might've been Instagram. We reached out to a couple real estate agents because we figured, hey, you know what? We have a drone, we have a camera. Let's reach out to real estate agents because they could use video to enhance their brand. We had no understanding of the application of video in business. Had I had some business acumen because obviously we grew up in a family business. We yeah. grew up with multiple family businesses yeah. and knew that marketing and you know, exposure was important to a business, but it, we hadn't transitioned into the new era of digital and business. So we didn't really understand how to add the value that we know how to add today. So looking back on it, it's pretty sickening and disgusting. It makes me want to throw up. We didn't reach out to just real estate agents. We reached out to literally everybody. Yeah, we and reached out to e everyone. The email was Shameless. something like this. My brother and I are trying to start a video production company. We are offering discounted rates. And then I went to like this whole two paragraphs of giving backstory about us yeah. and you know why we're trying to do this remember we got um we got a meeting with that hotel yeah. and we sat down with their yeah, whole yeah. like board we had like no portfolio we had Nothing. one job a hundred dollar job for george the real estate <laughs> agent filming flat land in atascadero and we were like you know what we're gonna get this it meeting. wasn't even flat land this guy <laughs> hired us to film a piece of land that no one would buy and I guarantee it's still on the market yeah. because it was like six acres <laughs> like on a brush covered <laughs> rocky <laughs> hillside. Yeah. But hey, that didn't stop us, it man. Didn't stop I us remember that. We somehow we got the meeting. We got the meeting with this high end resort in the San Luis Obispo area. Mm -hmm. And we were like going into it, we had really no clue what we were doing. We had zero portfolio. And they, you know, they eventually told us that, you know, we couldn't just pass up your your pricing because our prices were so low because we yeah. were getting into it. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they um, they wanted a certain type of video. I think it was a POV video uh, showing like their facilities, their resort. And yeah, they wanted a day in the life of someone day who in the staying life. at their resort. And we had nothing similar to that yeah. at all. And so I remember we went home that day back to our um, apartments and we were like, let's crank out a video right now mm -hmm. the best we can um, representing what they discussed, what they wanted. Yeah. And we spent hours making something and mm -hmm. we sent it to them. And you know what? We didn't get the job. No. But hey, we I tried. We tried. We tried. And I would say that that also attests to how bad we wanted it because yeah. we were at the point where when someone wanted a project, if we didn't have it, we would go create a spec piece for them mm -hmm. and create it and send it to them. And in that situation, we sent them a spec piece and they ended up going with someone else, someone who we knew. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, he had been in the game for a lot longer mm -hmm. and we actually talked to him like a year or two later after he did that and he crushed it and, you know, he went on to do his own thing. I don't think he's in the, in the yeah. videography space anymore, but it's one of those things where looking back on it, how hungry we were out of the shoot is why we're at where we're at mm -hmm. today. And we'll get into that in later episodes, but we carry that same tenacity from that project to the next project. Mm -hmm. And then after we shot George's real estate video, we ended up shooting another project for George. After we shot his land, he loved it. We went out there with a the drone. We got him all this footage. We get, we just over delivered. Yeah. Then he had to shoot another real estate project and he asked us for photos. Mm -hmm. We didn't even do photos, but we shot like 300 photos for him mm -hmm. because we're just committed to getting the job done. We did that. Yeah. And then um, from there- Like a friend's birthday party on the beach. Mm -hmm. We then, ended up shooting, yep, a friend's birthday party on yeah. the beach, which I sort of saw the video there. It's a great video. Oh, um, it's called Elevated, which may <laughs> or may not be related to some of the content that was in the video. Yeah. But we, we just kept hustling out project. Yeah. And then that turned into shooting sorority videos. And mm -hmm. we shot a sorority video. And then we shot another sorority Event video. Event videos at the school. At, yeah, we started- Training videos for ASI uh, at Cal Poly. We shot- for at least six or seven of the Greek life organizations mm -hmm. at Cal Poly, all paid gigs, which then turned into shooting, like you said, mm -hmm. for ASI Cal Poly, we shot videos for Cal Poly, which then turned into us shooting a documentary in Oakdale. Yeah, okay. That's, we came yeah. back home for the summer and said, hey, you know what? 
let's shoot a documentary about the Oakdale mm-hmm. football culture. Yeah. So then that's when we reach out to Trent Merz on the Oakdale football coach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was because we were so at that point in our short careers, if that's what you want to call it, we had been doing a lot of short videos, montages, like Soren was just saying, stuff that we weren't overly passionate about, I guess you can say. And we wanted to test ourselves. You know, we're storytellers at heart. That's what we want to do. And I remember thinking, since we were going home for the summer, what kind of project can we do? And, you know, if you've listened to our past episodes, you'll know that Oakdale High, Oakdale as a community values their sports, especially the football team. And so we reached out to the coach and we asked him if we can make a documentary about the football team and the community. And he was on board with it. And so long story short, it's like we we made this documentary. We spent all summer, gosh, going to practices in 105 degree heat, going to morning practices, going to events, going to games. A good portion of our summer was dedicated to that. And I just remember, you know, going into it, we were still at that point really didn't have a whole lot. We didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. What we knew then was probably 10% compared to what we know now. But oh, I would say it was le- it's like 1%. Yeah. Yeah, and we, but we just went for it. We were like we, we had that confidence that mm-hmm. you know, we're going to test ourselves here. We're going to act like we know what we're doing, get us in the door mm-hmm. and roll with it. Right. And I mean, the reception we got from that, I mean, that was a, a, a long project. It was. Yeah. And I remember Merzon, he told us now recently, like what, seven years later, I thought you guys were crazy. I had no idea what you guys were doing. Yeah. And it's like, but he still took that chance on that. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm forever grateful um, for that opportunity because if we didn't make that documentary and get the reception that we did, you know, that could have crushed us right then yeah. and there. That was our first attempt at telling a more fleshed out story driven piece. And it was received so well to where I think it gave both of us that reassurance that we actually have something special here. I remember releasing it to the community and I think overnight it had 15,000 mm-hmm. views. Close. It, it was, yeah. it ripped through the community. Everyone in Oakdale saw it. We happened to create that documentary during a time where the football team was really good and they were doing really well in their season by the no. time we released it. Well, by the time we yeah, released yeah, it. That, that's the special story. What's the story behind it? The story behind it is we thought when we were filming that, because we filmed most of the, the footage of the games during the preseason, and they lost their, I think it was their first, they lost most of their preseason games. They lost the game to Sonora. They didn't lost to Sonora for, what was it, like decades, mm, yeah, right? Something crazy. Something. We'll have to check the, the, the text, the credits, and the film, but it did not look like they were going to have a very good season. And they ended up winning state. So they went from really not and they having won state it together. For the first time ever. Yeah. And, you know, we like to think that in some way, the documentary that we put out kind of motivated them because we put them on pedestals and made them into little celebrities. And so I think they did a great job of harnessing that and channeling it into their game. And they, like you said, I mean, they, they won state. They went from literally people thinking that this was going to be a bust season to reaching the pinnacle of Oakdale football. And that alone made me personally at least feel feel great. It's like, all right, you know, let, let's roll with this thing. We have something special here. This was our first attempt at any type of story-driven film. You know, yeah. we kind of did it. We pulled it out of our asses. You know, We really did. Like, let's just shoot as much content as we can. I don't know what we're going to do with it in post-production, but let's just go shoot and then we'll make something out of it, you know, and we did it, you know. <laughs> we did it. And I remember the feedback being great. And what ended up coming from releasing the OKG documentary, aside from putting together a film that told the story of uh, our high school football culture and the town we grew up in was – we booked 12 weddings after we shot oh, that yeah. film because people started reaching out to us and say, hey, can you sure. film our wedding? Can mm-hmm. you film our wedding? We always knew that we could get into the wedding videography world, but we didn't realize that after that we were going to book so many weddings. And mm-hmm. what we ended up doing was booking 12 weddings. And the first wedding was actually one of our friends at Cal Poly's sister. Mm-hmm. And we talked about it in a previous, or we talked about it in another episode that's coming out later, but we ended up going and shooting a wedding for one of our friends' sisters, which was 
once again, we had no idea what we were doing, <laughs> well, yeah, but we we'll just do it. <laughs> showed up and we did it. And I would imagine that any vendor that was there thought that we were seasoned experts with all the gear we yeah. showed up with and how many people we showed up with and the tactics we were using. And mm. we <laughs> studied YouTube and, and looked at blogs and we looked at how other videography companies had shot weddings before. So we were really prepared. And that's something that goes to show that when you grow up in a in a world of sports, you grew up in a world of preparation. You can almost prepare yourself for anything. Mm -hmm. You can train even if you're not there. And I remember watching, you know, race footage or maybe you watching baseball footage, trying to learn the other team and learn the game that translated into learning the filmmaking game. Mm -hmm. You had to watch what other people were doing to learn how shots were getting captured and yeah. where to be when the bride was up, at the altar with mm -hmm. her you know, husband and all the things we had no idea what we were doing. Yeah. We learned through observing and we learned through just like dedicated research. So we really did dive in once we got the opportunities and we had deals mm -hmm. in the books, we dove in and made sure that we delivered so that we could get more jobs moving forward. At that time, we didn't really understand how the business was gonna develop, but we definitely tried to over deliver for those clients and make sure that they had a good experience with us. And every one of those videos turned out amazing. The clients were happy. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, ultimately that led to a whole nother season of weddings being booked, which gave yeah. us this cushion, making me feel like, holy cow, we actually have a business next year. Mm -hmm. And now we know we have weddings in the books. Let's go figure out how to get other jobs. Yeah. Weddings was definitely something that we weren't even intentionally trying to get into. And now here we are six, seven years later, still doing it because mm -hmm. we capitalized on that opportunity. And I think that goes out to all the creators out there who are thinking about getting into a game, regardless of what it is. It's like, just, just take that opportunity, take that chance, get out of your comfort zone mm -hmm. and try it. We did the research, we did the homework, mm -hmm. and it turned out great. I would not say the passion was there for weddings. Sure. But, but we turned it into like a a story in a sure. way. You know, we wanted to make this our twist. Right. Along the lines of what I was talking about with passion, the passion doesn't necessarily have to be there in in this game. And what I mean by that is you might have to do things to make money as a creative yeah. where your passion might not be aligned with that. And that's okay because we took jobs. We hustled out so many projects in the early days mm -hmm. where I look back at other creatives who may have started when we started, who would look at us like, you guys are crazy for doing that. Like, yeah. why would you travel down to LA to shoot that for $500? Mm -hmm. Well, it's like, dude, we don't have a portfolio. We yeah. have to keep shooting. And I always remember saying, let's just keep shooting. Let's keep networking. Let's keep shooting. Mm -hmm. We'll just, we'll figure it out. They're going to hire us again for something else. And we shot I mean, a dozen weddings, we shot more sorority videos, mm -hmm. we shot more events, we shot more real estate videos. Yeah, we did a documentary for a nonprofit. We did a documentary, did a documentary for a nonprofit. For an agency out in like a, a, a honeybee ranch out in Huron, yeah. you know, out in the middle of nowhere. That was the first time we actually got contracted by a marketing agency yeah. who was outsourcing their video production, which then sparked a light and gave me the idea that we should start connecting with other agencies who may offer video production services, but they didn't have an in-house video production team. So that gave us an opportunity right there, which then opened doors to working with other agencies mm -hmm. who were outsourcing their video production. So we became kind of like the grunt workers for these agencies who were yeah. tired of doing the grunt work. Yeah. And so we just hustled and that's all we knew. We yeah. grew up it, like great integrity, right? You just keep working mm -hmm. and you give them a good product. You show up, you're honest, you deliver on time and the doors will keep opening yeah. and that's really what we did. And you, when you're starting out, I mean, there's no sugarcoating it. You kind of have to eat. Shit, yeah. Right. And I apologize for my profanity, but that is the reality of it. If you want to build a portfolio, if you want to be able to network with people and, you know, build something, mm -hmm. you have to start from the bottom. Nobody just gets into something and it goes from here to there. I mean, yeah. you hear stories about people who just got into videography and they're charging $5,000 for this and that. And it's like, how much mm -hmm. experience do you have? Well, I just learned how to shoot uh, a couple of weeks ago. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, and they're not really just, getting jobs you know, because they're overpricing exactly, everything. Exactly. You have to really, you have to work into it as if you have no experience 
and you need to you have to be humble. You have to be humble. Right. At the end of the day, right. it's just like be humble right. and accept where you're at and understand that if you are trying to work with some big dog and you shoot them with big prices, mm-hmm. they're going to see right through your BS and know, all right, you're just mm-hmm. you're just trying to play the game. You're not really going to bring that much value. Yeah. You've just been working for, you know, a year at this point we're going to go with someone else. So we realized that early on and that's what really started to build the momentum Mm -hmm. for us. And ultimately we, we ended up finding some really good opportunities, but do you you remember slim chick? Yeah. We, that was such an adventure. We uh, got contracted to work for a liquor company. This was before I was 21. So I couldn't even drink legally. And they had us traveling to Hollywood. We were Santa Monica, Santa Monica. They put us up in hotels we were shooting for this liquor company, getting exposed to all these socialites, which yeah. we didn't really know what that was at the time. But obviously you're trying to get into the industry and these oh. people are showing up pretending like they're they, all hot They shit. would tell you without even saying anything. Well, I'm a celebrity. Do you know me? Yeah. You remember that? Going to those events, yeah. giving like, filming, giving the free samples of the drink and all that. And these people, these LA people, man, that was the first time I think that I truly got a bad taste in my mouth when I thought about Los Angeles, that area, and all these people, these shallow, empty people that made Mm -hmm. me sick to my stomach seeing them. Yeah. We got dipped right into that culture, man. And we were so young and barely into the game at all. And, oh my gosh, I remember that. The alcohol was great, though. I remember that. They would give us free samples to, like, uh, (laughs) film content. Yeah. We got some friends. uh, Got a bunch of bottles, never gave them back. Never give them back because we drank them all after we shot the content with the bottles. Um, then I th- we did we did do some dabbling into actually consumption just to test out, you know, give give them our opinion. Yeah, you wouldn't want to you know it. sell a product you didn't like. Exactly, I don't want to advertise market for a product if I didn't think it was actually good. <laughs> that was an experience. That was super cool, and that was um, from a connection. That was from uh, somebody that we knew at the time mm-hmm. at Cal Poly, and I think looking back on it, truly, what we were always really good at when we first started out was forming relationships yep. and networking. And it's almost like we just intrinsically knew that relationships open doors, right? It's like, and that is still to this day, a huge part of our business and business in general is mm-hmm. that you can never negate networking and meeting people in the handshakes and where that might lead. Like that, that's so important. Exactly. And yeah. to that point, before we wrap up here, I, I do want to talk about the relationship that we built before we really blew up Platinum Peak and took it to the next level. Mm -hmm. And that's the opportunity that I took to drive down to Beverly Hills. This was in the early days of digital marketing, okay? So this was during the days when people were starting to put courses out online. They were starting to market their services on social media and run ads and say like, click the link below and and like learn how to make a million dollars online. So we caught this opportunity to work with someone who was in that space. And I remember this clear as day. I bought a course online. I never took it, just like most people do. They buy a course online, they don't take it. And the guy who I bought the course from reached out to me and said, hey, how have you liked the course? And how's it doing for you? Have you made any money? Have you learned how to make money online? And I responded very honestly to him and said, hey man, you know what? Bought the course, looked at some of the content, I haven't done any of it because I'm really focused on making videos because what I really want to do is I want to make videos. I want to make documentaries. I want to make commercials. I want to do all these things that I thought that I really wanted to do, which I wanted to do, but I wasn't making a lot of headway in that regard because I didn't have the connections to do it. I wasn't getting paid the money that I wanted to be paid to do that. And this guy responded and said, Hey, I'm going to be down in Beverly Hills. I'm going to be at Ty Lopez's house. So if you know, if you're listening, yeah. you know who Ty Lopez is. He was the goat back then. He is the goat. He is the godfather of digital marketing. He is the guy who made the ad who, where he said, "Hey, I'm in my garage, and you should read books." He was there in his he was there in his house and his Lamborghini and all the flashy stuff that you see on social media. He he was going down to Ty Lopez's house in Beverly Hills, and he said, "I'm going to be down there. I'm going to be at an event. How about you come down and shoot me some ads and some social media content?" He didn't even mention paying me. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was dating a girl at the time. I was like, hey, let's go down to Beverly Hills. And I had another friend at the time. I was like, let's go down to Beverly Hills. My friend online I met is going to put us up at this hotel and we're going to shoot the social media content. We're going to do all this stuff. And we ended up going down to Beverly Hills. I shot 
a full day's worth of content. I remember getting home after we shot the content and getting it back to him within 24 hours. I remember telling you, you were the one who was editing at the time, mm -hmm. we need to turn this content around immediately. This is gonna be the biggest opportunity ever. And we turned that content around. We sent it to him within 24 hours before he even got back home to where he was coming from. Mm -hmm. And aside from the great experiences that I had down there in Beverly Hills, the people I met and the exposure that I got, I delivered the content to him and he sent me like $200. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, well, who cares? Like, yeah. This is gonna be the biggest opportunity ever. What came of that was within a week, I was feeling really confident. And then all of a sudden, like he was completely out of the picture. He didn't talk to me for, it was six months. He had no connection. He didn't reach out to me. And I was like, oh, dang it. Another one of those things where we committed all this time and energy, we sold ourselves, and nothing came of it. Mm -hmm. Bummer. But then all of a sudden, six months later, we kept hustling. We kept doing more projects. I know we, we did a couple other projects, some other weddings. And then six months later, he hits me up and he tells me, hey, I'm going to be doing a 14-day road trip through Washington. Right? Yeah, I don't even remember. Idaho. But he was doing this 14-day road trip and he invited me and he's like, I want to shoot a documentary about pretty much like my story and how I didn't go to college and how I pursued this digital life and everything that was very popular at the time online, he wanted to tell a story about it. We had some experience with documentary filmmaking and I remember sending him a contract for $9,500. Yeah. And what's funny is to this day, we have never finished that documentary. He still owes us $2,700. It's still on accounts receivable, yeah. but- We have all the content. We have all the content <laughs> and- when I look back at what that relationship turned into, since then his business has evolved. He made us his priority video production team. So Platinum Peak fulfills all of his video productions for all of his clients. We've shot over 90 projects to date for him. And in 2021, we 1099 like $300,000 from him alone. Mm -hmm. So like looking back on it, we did this project for $200, didn't have any idea what was going to yeah. come from it. And then in 2020 and 2021, I shot projects all through COVID for him. His business blew up during COVID because he was digital. He was online. He was doing all this stuff online when people couldn't do business in person. So we put all their businesses online, did a lot of ads, a lot of social content, sales videos, just project after project. I flew over 100,000 miles in 2020. How many, how many states? With him, 36 states in one year, 200 flights. I'm talking high volume in 2020, 2021, 2022. Mm -hmm. Even in 2023, we're still working with him, fulfilling projects. We've done over $700,000 in revenue from him alone. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really what sparked the next step for Platinum Peak when we started to get exposure to, okay, how are these online businesses and businesses in general using video content to take their businesses to the next level. Yeah. That's what then kicked open the doors. That's when the light bulb went on. The light bulb started going off like crazy. Up until that point, it was like, okay, yeah, you want a video? Here's a video. Put it on your website. It's going to look great. Here's a montage. Here's whatever it was. But at that point, when that opportunity was presented to us, mm -hmm. that's when the light bulb really started going that, okay, video is designed to actually solve people's problems. Right. It's meant as a medium to get somebody to a certain end goal. I remember those conversations we, we would start to have about that, that we would start to actually view video as like a weapon in a sense. Like right. this is way more powerful than what we have even thought about it. Sure, we can make people feel a certain way, which is very important, don't get mm -hmm. me wrong. But at the end of the day, providing value with video really comes down to providing businesses with a solution. And that's something that you, through this experience, learned first. And then that's when the conversation started going. And I feel like that's when our business really started to reshape and really grow and, you know, catapult to where it, it is now. It got exciting. Yeah. I remember the first couple trips where we were fulfilling the video production services for that agency and thinking, holy cow, like we've never had a project when they're paying us this much money to shoot projects. I'm getting to fly around. I'm getting to meet yeah. all these really wealthy people, m work with all these different businesses, see the ins and outs and the operations of these businesses, get into their offices and understand how businesses were going from either brick and mortar or even from online businesses or from already scaled businesses to taking their products and services online and 
understanding, holy cow. So we have a solution that this guy relies on. His business relied on video production mm -hmm. with a suite of other services. We were working with copywriters. We were working with funnel builders. We were working with media buyers. Media buyers. We were working with um, project managers. Project managers. Yeah. We were working with this whole suite mm -hmm. of characters that we had never been exposed to before. Yeah. And we were making good money at the time. And we were like, holy cow, we need to double down mm -hmm. and we need to start buying more equipment. And I remember we thought, well, let's buy more equipment. That's going to be what gets us to the next level, which is a mistake we made. But looking back on it, we continued to book ourselves out. And like I said, in 2020, I remember flying through COVID, being on a 737 jet in March. April of uh, 2020, when everything had shut down, being on a 737, 150 passenger jet with six people, no one was flying. Everyone was terrified to get around, but this like-minded individual who, Ben, who had this agency, he was not going to stop his business. He was going to fly me around, paid for everything, put me up at hotels. We showed up to businesses. We shot all their advertisements. We shot all their sales videos. We shot all their social media content. We delivered it back to Ben and you were editing all the footage at the time. I'd come home, yeah. give you the footage. <laughs> You're like, just figure it out. Or like, here's this, isn't that? Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember that. Oh. We were just hustling and we were making good money and it was exciting. And we knew this was the next step. And we started to learn, okay, when our clients and when other clients started to come to us, let's turn around and sell them the same solution. Not necessarily to the same regard in like selling them advertisements and everything, but we knew how to take video and apply it to these businesses problems. Mm -hmm. And we really understood our value proposition and looking at businesses and saying, okay, are you having a sales marketing or yeah. operational problem? Like, what do you need? How can we help you solve mm -hmm. those problems using video? Yeah. And it was a paradigm shift. It was a complete paradigm shift. Yeah. And that's where we really started to flourish in 2020, 2021. And then in 2020, 2020, we hired our first employee, yeah. which was one of my buddies. And he came on board to help us with project management because we had all these projects coming in and we knew we had, we had to hire someone to help us manage the projects. We had all this footage mm -hmm. and we knew we need to hire a project manager and contract out the editing. Right. So that was our first time that we really sat down and said, okay, we have all these projects. Erickson, you can't keep editing because you're just spending all the time behind the computer. I'm out shooting and traveling and working with clients and right. doing all the contracting. And that's when we brought on Karsten as our project manager and we started to contract out the editing. Mm -hmm. And that was a whole- That edit. was hard for me to, it's one of those things about delegating because at that point I was editing all the weddings, everything we would get, I would edit. I loved editing at that point, but it was getting to a point where it was exhausting. And I remember aside from the project manager, aside from Karsten, delegating the work when it came to editing was something that was difficult for me because it was like up until that point, mm -hmm. we were really confident with the quality of the outputs we would deliver. Right. And I'm not saying I was ever the best editor because I wasn't honestly, but we were happy with what we had. Our, our clients were happy. That was a lesson for me personally to like learn to delegate and learn that if, if scaling was ever going to be a thing, if we were ever going to scale, it's like, yeah. that is the first thing that has to happen with the influx of footage, the influx of jobs that we were getting. Mm -hmm. There's no way in hell that one person can do it all. You had to go from being an operator to being somebody who is a leader in a sense and right. overseeing these projects and over overseeing the direction, the creative direction. And I struggled with that at first. I had a hard time kind of letting go, whether that was the ads, whether that was the wedding videos we would do, whatever it was. It only made the business stronger because of that. Um, that's so right. That's, that's essential to, to scaling, to growing. Right. I remember coming home from being gone for three weeks and shooting three to six projects. I would fly from state to state to state, business to business to business, and come home with <laughs> SD cards full of footage. Like saying, three, here's SD cards. Here's, <laughs> here's this project and here's this project. Yeah. And Erickson would be there and he'd start editing a project and then Carson would... Carson, who was our project manager yeah. at the time, he would be working with these editors that I've contracted from mm -hmm. online. I would be up all night trying to talk to people overseas or even in the States. Hey, we got to edit this project. Like what's it going to cost and working the deal out and then, you know, getting them the footage online, which is, which is still like a rarity because people still don't send their footage out. We were sending footage out yeah. using whatever cloud-based yeah. service we could at the time. We were using Dropbox, we were using Google, we were using WeTransfer, we were mm -hmm. using, I remember like, literally anything to get the footage out and just piecing it all together. Mm -hmm. And that really 
it stress tested us. It put us in a position where, holy cow, like we can continue to do this, but we need to create some serious organizational mm. systems here. Right. Or we're going to drown. Yeah. And that's what really just sparked the next chapter of Platinum Peak. Stressful times, but times that were needed to propel us forward. And I think a lot of it came down to, at least for me personally, when I was editing, almost letting go of the ego in a sense, because I think creatives have generally they have a bit of an ego. And so it's like mm -hmm. when you're editing something or you're doing something, whatever it is, it's like, no one can do this. Like I can do it. Only I can do it this way. Right. Right. And so it's like, once you finally kind of see that, if you're aware enough and mature enough to be able to sit back and view it, it's like, no, it's all right. You know, other people can do it too. Yeah. And as long as you give them the right prompting and the right uh, direction, the vision, that's, what happened, I think, in general, and not just on the editing side, but just being able to delegate work, like, for example, like a project manager, and then that leading to more things. And we'll get into that in the next episode about how it all unfolded. But yeah, looking back on it, man, just what a, what a, what a journey. Jesus. It really is. Yeah. It's crazy how you put time and effort into something and all of a sudden the lid just blows open and you need to take those risks. You need to work those hours and put in the work for people and over deliver and doors will open as a creative. And I really look forward to talking about it in the next episode. We don't have any more time now, but in the next episode, I want to continue talking about how Platinum Peak unfolded. And mm. I want to talk about how we went from you being the editor, mm -hmm. the solo editor to now we have 13 editors. Mm -hmm. We have two project managers. Yeah. We have an operations director. And we won some awards along the we've way. We've won some awards for different projects that we've shot. And it's crazy to think about how that one relationship that we built, which we still work for. I'm going to leave here in a couple of days. I'm going to be directing three projects back to back next week. I'm going to be in Louisville. I'm going to be in Vegas. I'm going to be in Kentucky. All back to back. And no, Idaho. I, in Idaho. yeah. yeah. You said Louisville and Kentucky. Okay, yeah, sorry. So I'm going to be in They're Louisville. They're basically different because the city is so different than the actual state. Right. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I'm going to be in all these different places. Two of those projects are going to be for the same agency that we kicked the doors open with Platinum Peak. And what's crazy is we're sitting here talking about this. And when you look at the rest of 2023, we have dozens of projects to fulfill for that same agency alongside a bunch of other projects that we're working on. And what's really cool is the origin of that story was me driving down to Beverly Hills on a whim, missing mm -hmm. class, giving up my education, just hoping that this was going to turn into something. And at yeah. the, uh, to date, this has been, I mean, it's been a great relationship for mm -hmm. our business. It's opened so many doors. It's given me exposure to so many different business opportunities it's outside of the video production realm. It's opened up opportunities for real estate, um, real estate syndication jobs, uh, private equity deals, everything that we've been exposed to and we've got our hands into outside of the video production space. It's crazy what one opportunity could potentially mm -hmm. lead you to. And I really look forward to talking about that in the next yeah. episode. What one risk can, can lead to. One risk. One risk. It's opportunity, right? Yeah. You just take it. You might flop or you might hit a grand slam. And at this point, we've hit a grand slam. And I thank you, Ben, for being that segue for our business. And I know you see us as a very valuable asset to your team and everything that we brought to you outside of those deals, because for the listeners now, what we were doing with that agency turned into other deals that we collectively put together. Once you start working with someone and they see your value, you're going to be able to put other deals together that may be outside the scope of what you originally thought you were going to be working on together. Yeah. That's crazy. And we've worked on dozens of projects outside of what we originally thought we were going to be working on. So. Gosh. Yeah. We should write a book one day. One you day. should. Yeah. That's uh, good. Autobiography. <laughs> well, that's going to wrap it up. Thank you for listening to the Scaling Creator Podcast. In the next episode, we are going to be talking about scaling and how Platinum Peak eventually grew into what it is today, the steps we took, what were the pain points that we needed to address in order to scale working with businesses, agencies, and other creators using video as a tool to solve problems and get them to the next level as a business. We're going to be talking about who we've worked with, where we've traveled, and then also looking back on it, what were the most challenging things that we faced when it came to scaling a video production company? So 
Tune into the next episode of the Scaling Creator Podcast. I know this was a long one, but this is really where Platinum Peak turned from being a video maker to a video agency, a business that has employees, people that are delivering for other businesses and always delivering value. Check us out at scalingcreator.com. Follow us on Instagram at Scaling Creator. We're on Spotify, Apple Music. Share this with your friends, any creators that you might know. Get this out there. This episode is transformational. The next episode is going to be even better where we really dive into how we apply video to sales, marketing, operational initiatives. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Peace.